Welcome everybody to Brad Tax Hard Facts Live, right? So that's the whole fun part of watching live. You never know what's going to happen. We finally got our friend Jeff Shoup connected here. Um, after many trial runs, I swear it worked just fine. And here we are, we're ready to rock and roll. So um, tonight um, we have a good friend of ours, uh, Jeff Shoup. We are going to be running the gamut of engine company operations. So is engine company fundamentals. Jeff's been around for a, a long time, teaches on the circuit, has a lot of information and wisdom to drop about engine company operations. And we're going to get into that. Um, if you're watching the firehouse, uh, thank you. Um, give us some love. Give us a hashtag. Share us on Instagram. We will share your story. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, give us a watch party. Get your friends on board. Um, this should be a good night. Before I pass it on to Jerry, um, I just want to tell just a little story, and I usually want to do this, a, a little quick story of the first time I met Jeff Shoup. So um, I was uh, 22 years old. I had just graduated college. I just started working full-time for Elkhart Brass. I was at FDIC with one of our, uh, our good friends, one of our old sales reps, Roger Johnson. Uh, the guy was well known across the Midwest is uh, one of our solid guys. Uh, Roger showed me a lot along the way and we are at FDIC for hot drills. So obviously it's kind of the signature event of FDIC and we are at the Wayne Township Tower. So those of you who have uh, been there, flowed water there, trained there, seen it from driving by on the freeway, you know, this is a very large tower. It's what, six stories, uh, but it's deceiving because it's the stories, yeah, the stories aren't real, real stories, right? They the are story building. Yeah, they're 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 big stories. Yeah, put your name up there, Jeff. So uh, Roger's there, and he's got me, and I got my new fancy turnout gear, and I'm ready to be the Elkhart Brass guy. And and Raj goes, "Why don't you go up to the top and see what's going on?" So um, I walk up to the top of this training tower. Water's you know just gushing down. The stairwell, you're soaked by the time you get up there. For all you guys watching that have either drilled there or teach there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I get to the top of the stairs, uh, the very top of the, the, the top floor, and there's Jeff. And Jeff used to have a prop up there. He called his, uh, quote, you know, hallway from hell. And what it was was you opened up a line and you advanced with a three-person company through this hallway until you got to the very end. And then that's when you could shut the line off. So I kind of watched maybe two, three evolutions of this. And I was kind of the, you know, we've all been there, the young guy kind of in the back with my arms crossed, kind of trying to not be in anybody's way in, in, in front of any paying customer. And uh, Jeff goes, hey, you know, the old car kid, come here. So <laughs> he, uh, he puts me on the line. Now, granted, this is a two and a half with the inch and eighth tip on it. And I, I ran that nozzle, you know, and, and he pushed me all the way through that hallway uh, of hell, as he called it. And I finished that, man. And I was that was like week one on the job. And I'm like, this is awesome. I, I'm going to have a lot of fun here. I made a great friend. And and it was from that point you learned the importance of, you know, one of my favorite brass tax episodes is Jeff's done is the nozzle team positions is that nozzle man, the backup firefighter and the door firefighter as a nozzle firefighter, even though this was like a super intimidating evolution, um, it was easy because you had a good backup firefighter and a door firefighter and Jeff taught everybody that way. So before I, I throw it off to Jerry, I, I just had to get a little bit sentimental there with Jeff and, and share with him the first time I had met him. And that really thumbprinted kind of me along the way of, of what I've learned and continue to teach and interact and, and all that good stuff. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in. I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. I'm going to throw it off to Jerry so we can get to the meat of this here. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, May 13th, 2020. Uh, tough year, obviously, but um, we're, we're here. We're sticking with it and we're glad to, to, to be part of this new format. Um, a little bit about Jeff. Uh, Jeff and I go back a lot of years. Um, well, I get, look at the color of our hair. It's the same. That'll tell you how far we go back. <laughs> uh, and and be, before I, I give it off to him, um, I can't tell you how many late night conversations he and I have had about the fire service. 
and and we're, we're we're very much in sync when we talk about it especially at those late late those late hours but inevitably you know we've both been around for a very long time it always circles back to as much as we think things have changed they really haven't and the approach to the job hasn't changed and that's a foundation that I've always been able to, to grab from Jeff as a mentor of mine, and it centers you. So keep that in the back of your mind when we're going through this tonight. This, this is years of experience that can center you as a firefighter, and it is firefighter level stuff. It's firefighter 101. That's usually where it breaks in mastery of the basics. So with no further ado, uh, my good friend, Jeff, give us a little background on yourself and Tell us what drove you to the discipline that you go to the depth in engine company operations. Wow. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me tonight. This is, this is, I hope we have a, a lot of fun with this. You know, I'm looking at some of the names that are uh, writing in already. Hi guys. How you doing? Thanks for coming. Thanks for spending your evening with us. Uh, boy. Yeah. Jerry, you're right about the color of the hair. It is a, t uh, a telling tale on that one. My God. Here's what Here's a picture. I forgot to load this, but you can all see it now. There's, there's a uh, Jeff backing up Jerry during the filming of Brass X Hard Facts on yeah. a little walk down yeah. between scenes. But they've been te teammates for life. <laughs> we do, we do, we go way back there. I mean, that's the thing. You know, as time goes by, you don't realize, and and when you think. When did we meet? And when? When? Where? And what was it? And a son of a gun, you start trying to you know put the years together, and it was way back there. Yeah, <laughs> as right. Simple as that. It was just way back. So yeah, we've gone through a lot of changes together, and you know opinions, philosophies, ideas. Like he says, you know, him and I would uh, always talk, you know, long distance or whatever, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, you guys asked a little bit about me. I grew up in Canton. Canton, Ohio, Football Hall of Fame city. And, uh, you know, it was uh, one of those things. Uh, Canton had an interesting fire department. They had 10 engines, three ladders when I was a kid growing up. And I just uh, used to love, uh, you know, visiting the firehouses. And uh, at one firehouse, by the way, they had one engine and two trucks. And that was interesting. One was a tiller, one was a straight. And they ran and then five, six guys on an apparatus, chief ran out of there and so forth. So those were uh, great times, you know, uh, with Canton. So anyways, uh, when I was eight years old, I was looking at that tiller truck and we were down there. I, I must have been Cub Scouts or something like that, you know, going on a tour of the new fire station back in 1960. And for some reason, it stuck with me. You know, that guy who sits in the rear basket, you know, and takes the, uh, or drives the rear wheels and so forth. When uh, I got into high school, hell, I didn't know what I was going to be when I got out. I was lucky to get out of high school. So, you know, I was uh, one of those things. When I got out of my, uh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't going to college, that's for damn sure. And, uh, but I got out of my active duty, you know, my one neighbor says, well, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. And uh, at that time, you had to be 21 to take the test for fire departments. It wasn't like now where, you know, 17 year old can take the test or whatever. No, you had to be 21 to uh, take the test for a uh, fire position. And I said, well, since I don't know what I'm going to do, what do you think? He says, well, I should take the test for the fire department. And for some reason, it just, boom, snapped. You know, it's just like, wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool, you know. And it just was something that I got into. So, again, you know, uh, I was hired in uh, August of 74. Yeah, that makes me an old guy, you know. Uh, and it was like, oh, my God, you know, this is it. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I can look back at those times. Those were great times. And uh, I still have contact with one of the guys I worked with in the 70s. I'll try to bring up a picture of the neighborhood we worked in. You guys probably have seen that, you know, the old tenement buildings and apartment buildings yeah. and stuff like that, you know. And we talk about those times together, you know. And, and so we're both retired now. He's down in Florida. You know, I'm retired here and doing this stuff with strategic fire training and the guys of strategic fire training and the stuff I've done with you guys and 
everywhere else too. So, but uh, anyways, I, I've been very fortunate. This job has been very good to me. Uh, I've got a, I've gotten a career out of it. I've gotten some great people around me, and uh, my family has benefited from it and so forth. And you know, it's just one of those things. And you know, it continues. And boy, I tell you what, <laughs> I hope it can continue for a few more years. You know, where I can do things like this and go out and do the training work and so forth. It's it's, it's a rush. And believe me, the guy sitting next to me, you, you know, you've heard he's my son. You know, because when I went to that firehouse and him and I started working together, it was like, holy cow, this guy is like, and he's kind of carrying on what I was doing. You know, when I walked out the door and I had to walk out the door and that's not a disciplinary thing either. I want you to know that I had to leave. <laughs> no, I just ran out of time. And uh, he's carrying on that thing about, you know, engine operations and continuing on the tradition and so forth. So hey, Jeff, have your, you're talking about John, right? You haven't popped. Your head right. Yep. Pop your pop your head in there, John. There's John, here. <laughs> John is only here for IT purposes. So you can't talk nozzles, anything like that. But but anyway, um, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the little bio. How about we get the PowerPoint up? Uh, Jeff's got some slides that he does from his uh, program of engine company fundamentals. Um, John's gonna put those up and we're gonna get rolling here. There we go. Okay. Uh, you want me to narrate it? Yeah, sure. Okay, Let's good. Well, this, this is the class uh, at the Cleveland Fire Academy back in 2009. Let's go back to the one before. There we go. Okay. You got to uh, hold on. I was. Uh, hey, John. I John, was, you got to click the share slide there. So this uh, um, share share screen. Where at? You got it. You got it, Chris. No, on the top left, on the on the left hand side. Share our screen. Okay. How about now? Uh, nope, not. Oh, here we go. All right. Is that it? Yep, we got it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. Okay. Put you, hey Jeff, uh, I'm gonna put your slides on, and then uh, you'll be able to see your slides, but you won't see yourself. So that's the rub of the program. Yeah, that's fine. But That's the way it is right now. We get to see the good stuff, and we get we still get to see you. So don't make any uh, you know rude faces or anything. Oh. <laughs> there we go. All right, go for it. All right, cool. Okay, this is 2009. This is at the uh, Cleveland Fire Academy, and I was doing the class on uh, engine operations for this academy class, which you know I think it was a 13 or 14 week class. And these are all the new kids. These are the cadets. Departments everywhere else has got a name for their new people. Probies, cadets, candidates, re recruits, rookies, whatever. To, uh, when, I, when I was a young fireman, you had a lot of older bosses. And I mean, these guys came from World War II, Korea. They were children during the Depression. And they grew up in a very uh, unique environment and they were disciplined and they were survivors and so forth, especially the vets and so forth from uh, World War II and Korea. When they got on the fire service, you know, to them it was hitting the lottery back then for them. But the one thing they did, they protected the job. And when you uh, had rules, regulations, procedures, things like that, they did them, they followed them and so forth. When I became a career uh, firefighter, like I said, back in 1974, those guys, those were the bosses. Those were the senior people and so forth. And they made sure that you were going to follow the rules and follow the procedures of the department. And that's what probationary time was all about. If you didn't uh, uh, make it, well, then you were told to find another profession because you just weren't going to make it there and so forth. And that's what it was all about. So from that, I learned this is what firefighting is all about. It's supposed to be a team sport, and it begins in the academy. And that means that every firefighter there who's teaching in that academy class needs to be in the same page, giving the same message. And that is firefighting is a team sport because you're breeding these guys to be 
the people who are going to carry this on as they go through their careers. And, you know, I, 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 uh, I know it's not realistic to think that we all carry the same attitude. We all have the same love for the job and so forth. We, we know that's not true. Uh, I do the uh, Senior Man Show with Bob Pressler and Jeff Rothmeyer, and Bob was bringing it up one night about the 90%, the 10%, and then we took it one step further to the one percenters. You know, 90% of the guys are here for the job, the paycheck, and stuff like that. 10% really do have a love affair with the job and really do want to be as good, and they want their fire department to be as good as it can be. And then there's that 1% who takes it even to the other level and so forth. So it's one of those interesting things about the uh, attitudes, the people, the person, uh, uh, personnel, and, and so forth, and, of course, the culture and traditions of, of the departments and so forth. So I'm going to go to the next one. See, like I said, here in the academies where you start building that stuff. Have you got that next slide there? Yep, we're good. Okay. Well, this is what it's supposed to be like out in the street. So when it's time to pick up after a, a, a fire, you know, you don't have to say, hey, we need your help and so forth. No, it's boom, boom, boom. One of those things that everybody knows that this is what we do. And this is, you know, once again, team operation. By the way, if you look up in the top of the hose bed there uh, with the black uh, helmet on, uh, that's yours truly. And the guy there folding the four inch hose is the gentleman sitting next to me right now. And this is down at uh, Fullerton and East 65th. <laughs> and he took a good beating at that fire. So, but uh, anyways, yeah, there, there you go right there. You know, you build, you build the team as people come into the job and you've got to stay with those disciplines and so forth. So, how's that? Good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But, you know, it's, it's probably what, what, what a great message because, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you do see in the academy that maybe you don't come out with, but that's the one is is teamwork um the two pitchers couldn't be better married yeah and, and like i said earlier about the uh, instructors you have in academy all those guys need to be experienced and they need to be on the same page together mm -hmm. yep. so, yeah so okay okay let me go back there so you know one of the things also i, I was gonna throw out here you know, firefighting itself, you know, it, it, it's always been, at least from what, what I've seen, competitive. What's that? Yeah. Co competitive in, in, in some way uh, or some, some nature and so forth. You know, they've always had in the past competition between companies, between shifts and so forth, and sometimes between fire departments. Sometimes you get competition between guys on the job. You know, who, who can pull the most ceilings you know, or who, who can drag that line in the, you know, the fastest, the deepest or whatever, or stuff like that. What engine can get there first and get first water in a fire. So, but that, that's, uh, that's one of the things about teamwork. I, you know, I would say, so, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> we got uh, a comment from Kevin on the side there trying to get more of the, into the 10% club and then more that are in the 10 into the one. And, you know, I guess sometimes that competition is actually an asset in that, um, you, you know, that I've, I've always felt strongly and, 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 and I think you have too. I think we've agreed on this, that, you know, a single person can change a company, a mindset, it's a drive and it, and it can be, it can be in through, it, it basically infectious. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's how it grows. You know, that's how, that's how companies become good companies uh, that are functional parts of a battalion or, or whatever your structure is. But, you know, it starts with the individual sense of ownership, and that's driven by the culture. I totally agree with you. You know, and I, I think you'll agree with me on this, too. There may be a mediocre company out there, and nothing's happening within. You know, it's almost like a static operation. One person walks in there and talks a different game, and you don't have to be an officer. But if you're a good firefighter with, with, with some background to you and you're talking about something different, you can have an impact on those guys because maybe they're looking for that guy to walk in there. Sure. And I got to tell you, you know, there's firehouses like that. You know, one of the things that happened uh, where John and I worked together, 
you know, it had a reputation, and as many fire departments do, you get reputations about firehouses that, yeah, nobody wants to work there. Oh, my God, the guys don't even eat together. They don't do this together. They don't work well together or whatever. And I was in another firehouse for a long time. I needed a change and put in for the uh, uh, this firehouse. And uh, there were other guys there, and much like we're talking about, where – Oh, some guys talking a different game and so forth. And some guys were listening and it was like, wow. Next thing you knew, you had another guy transferring in, another guy transferring in because there were openings. The truck had uh, changed personnel quite a bit. And uh, next thing you know, you got yourself a top firehouse. And uh, the other thing is uh, the activity level, too. That's another thing. You know, to, that helped a lot, you know. Having that activity where the guys can get out there and work together and do stuff together and so forth on the streets means a lot. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jeff. I just I had a, a conversation about this with a friend the other day. You kind of hit it, and this isn't necessarily the top of the conversation, but I think it's important when we're on. We're talking about company, you know, good companies, bad companies, company pride, you know. And you talked about eating together and drilling together. You know, I mean. Although you were at Engine 11 most of your career, there's no doubt you had a lot of interaction with other companies. I mean, in your perspective as, as the senior man, how important is that kind of stuff of, you know, just something as simple of having a meal once a day together or doing a drill once together, even the slow firehouses where you're not, you don't get that morale boost by putting all your training to work all the time. Um, what can you be doing in the firehouse to kind of build that strong company? I had a lot of years on at 11 and I went in there and I was kind of quiet because I was scoping people out, you know, because, Hey, maybe nobody's going to listen to me. Maybe nobody wants to talk about fires. You know, I mean, I'm just there, you know, passing through, you know, and, and that was it. And as, as a short amount of time went on, like I said, guys uh, started uh, talking. And so John and I, yeah, again, that's where I met John. Him and I would be up till midnight, one o'clock in the morning for a couple of reasons. Number one, at that firehouse, you're always going to be going out about that time. Okay, so there's no sense of going to bed. And But the other thing was, him and I would just talk, talk about the job, talk about our families, talk about whatever. And like I said, as other guys came in and so forth, uh, for, uh, you know, hey, man, you know, see, Levin's game is changing and stuff like that. It was like really neat because then the seniority thing started. And, and so there's an engine on the ladder at that firehouse. And you got at least four guys on each apparatus. Now, here's here's how it sticks. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's got a, that is just the floor layout, everything, you know, people are just, you know, waiting to get into that place, I, I could say, you know, because of its reputation now. I retired in February 2011. My seat at the kitchen table is like an L. So you got at least eight guys sitting there twice a day. My position, my plate was right there at the intersection of the L. And I cooked, Brian cooked, uh, Rick cooked, you know, we had three of us who were regular. And I mean, we, we just, you know, it brought guys together. We did a great job and it was super. Anyways, I re was retired probably seven or eight years, you know, so it's nine years now that I've been retired. So seven or eight years, I went back into the firehouse and I still go back there and do some training work, you know, with the guys. John's got them out back and so forth and we're laying lines and so forth. I went in there one time and it was time for lunch. And the guy who sits in that seat now, he says, here, it's your seat. You want to talk about something that really hit me and I loved it. And I said, thanks, Mark, but uh, it's your seat now. And that's, you know, you can't ask for any more, you know, than that from the guy who you work with, you know. Yeah, yep. it's his seat now. so. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? That's Jeff, how you, know, you got a comment on the card from TJ Brady saying uh, Thursdays are for chicken parm, right, Shoop? Yeah. <laughs> 
Jerry, remember when I was down in uh, South Carolina and TJ was one of the guys and I tried and tried to get some, uh, you know, things started down there, you know, yeah. at 11, when I was there every Thursday night was chicken parm night. I would start the, the red sauce after lunch and, uh, Chicken parm and, and noodles or, you know, spaghetti or whatever, linguine, I don't care. It doesn't matter. You know, we had chicken parm. And I was down there in South Carolina trying to get some traditions started, ways of doing things. And I says, guys, back home at 11, every Thursday night's red sauce night, chicken parm. So I was at that one firehouse in North Myrtle. And I told the guys there, we're going to have chicken parm tonight. I gave the one guy a phone number. I said, call this number right now. Don't tell him who you are, but ask, what are you guys having for supper tonight at 11? So the guy did. And I think it was Brian, Brian McCafferty picked up the phone. He says, and then the question, hey, what are you guys having for supper today? He says, chicken parm, why? Who's this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, see, there you go. So that's the couple of the cool things right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Uh, it's been interesting, you know, throughout the years. Like I said, I got to see a lot of a lot of things over that time. Still get to see a lot of things and, and, and how things are going and what have you. And uh, sometimes, like we're talking about right here with cultures and traditions and disciplines, uh, we talk about the firehouses, companies, and things like that. But I remember some of the basic rules that were unwritten, but, you know, they were out there. For example, uh, the watchman. You always have a man at the watch desk 24-7. And uh, the waste basket by the watch desk, well, actually in the firehouse, were emptied every afternoon at 4 o'clock by the watchman there. That was one of the duties of the watchman. And when we were pulling, you know, like I say, 24-hour watches, the guy who had what they call the six to eight, he at seven o'clock cleaned the kitchen. Cleaned the kitchen for the oncoming shift. Now, mind you, the kitchen was cleaned after dinner the night before. It's standard tradition, a standard way of doing business. But again, that was it, you know. Even though you change shifts at 8.30, 7 o'clock, the watchman cleans the kitchen, getting it ready for the oncoming shift. And, uh, you yeah, know, it was like those things that always, you always did. They were simple disciplines. It wasn't screwing with anybody like some people would think today. No, it's just the way the fire service is and the way it does business. And then, of course, signing on in the watch desk. You know, I, this is interesting. When you would go on watch, you'd sign on. And you'd have to say T and H, okay, WP, 85 or whatever. You know what that was? T and H was tires and heater because a lot of firehouses, that's a carryover from the days when a lot of firehouses were coal-fired or they had oil-fired furnaces to keep the firehouse warm and what have you and stuff like that. And uh, the WP, every firehouse in the city, has a water main going by it, especially when they're located on main drags. Well, there was a water pressure gauge in some area, sometimes in the watch desk, sometimes in another part of the firehouse. But when you went on watch, you checked the tires and the apparatus, made sure the heater was working, especially in the winter time. Didn't worry about too much about the tires and heater in the summertime, but anyways, tires, yes. But the water pressure. And you know, you record the water pressure. You want to make sure that it stays steady and stuff like that. Here I am, a young kid on a squad in Cleveland, and uh, the captain's nickname was God. I mean, this guy had the power, you know, and he, he it was like a, a, a privilege to work at the God squad, as they would say. <laughs> His crews were all handpicked, all senior guys, tough as nails. They came through the riots and things like that in the 60s. And they got over there, you know, to that company. And he told me one time, he says, son, my senior men run my company for me. And if you have a problem, you take it to them. And if they have a problem that they can't fix and it gets to me, son, you got a real big problem. 
And that, that's, I was like, okay, yes, sir. So anyways, I'm going on a watch one night. Oh, God, it must have been about 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so you got an engine, a ladder, a squad, and a chief in there. And son of a gun, I walked around the fire apparatus, all of them, and the squad had a low tire. <laughs> oh, God. Why me? <laughs> so I go to the captain's office, knock on his door at this time in the morning. The captain, captain, the squad has a, a low tire. And uh, he said, okay, go talk to Joe. Well, Joe was driving a squad, a senior man that night. You know, I had to get him up out of bed, and, and that was it, take care of the tire. But uh, son of a gun. Just for, and you never realize how important it is to do those things. And there were reasons why you did those things. So, again, I don't even know if that stuff's even thought of today in the fire. So, service. so I like that. That's great. Like, these are great stories I, and stories I've never heard from you. Um, is there any of these kind of traditions, things that maybe you, you experienced on the job that might, you know, is in addition to cleaning the kitchen, things like that, that, maybe relate specifically to maybe the nozzle firefighter position or oh, yeah. region company. Like what were traditions or things that you had or the senior man instilled in you when you were coming up on engine 11 or things that you instilled on your new guy. So all of a sudden you had a, a new kid out of the Academy and now he's right on your rig. What are some of these traditions or unwritten rules that you would throw to them? Oh, yeah, if you're working on an engine, remember, engines are all about teamwork, like that slide showed. Mm -hmm. And engines have have the job to get water in the fire, whether you're first engine, second do, third do, or wherever you're coming in in the assignment, your job is water first. And to do that, it's a team approach. And officers on engines have to make sure that their people operate like that. You know, however your department's set up, do you go send your first engine straight to the fire building or do you do a forward lay? Do you send your engine to the fire building and it reverses out? I don't know. But the whole thing is on an engine, your job is water, water on the fire. Second engine, that's what SOPs are for. Third engine, same thing and so on down the line. You just can't get off an engine grab an ax and a hook and go break out windows. What the hell good is that going to do if nobody's putting uh, any water in the fire? All it's going to do is create a bigger problem. And, and that's what people have to understand about it. So, you know, uh, I was, uh, once again, just a couple months on a job, and we were responding this one mm -hmm. night. And it's the one thing that uh, I've told people about many times. You know, we talk about mentoring and uh, seniority and so forth. My senior man was sitting across the engine. Remember, guys, you know, we didn't have closed cabs back then like we do now. So you had the open cab, you had the engine between you and stuff like that, and then open air. And there's a report it's a working fire down you know, off of Lakeview Road or somewhere like that. And I look across at uh, my senior man, who is still my senior man today, by the way. We still have coffee every few weeks, uh, you know, when we can. I says, what are we going to do when we get there? It's a working fire. Hey, uh, he looked across at me ever so calmly. And he came on, you know, in 66 or something like that. So he was one of those old guys. He says, follow the senior man. Just that calmly. And I remember it all these years to today. And I remember the look in his face, you know, just follow the senior man. So we don't want some young kid who's full of piss and vinegar running off and doing what he thinks or getting lost or something like that, or doing something that you're not supposed to engine work is teamwork. And you learn from those people within that company. So, yeah. And I learned about water early on too. <laughs> I gotta tell you, you know, all these things about, you know, flow and so forth, uh, how much water we throw at a fire. And, and, and some people sometimes have, an experience that really wises them up early in their career. And this is a funny story. And I told it to Chad Gruber, one of our guys. And he said, oh, you got to tell that one. So, you know, I think I just had under two years in the job. And we had a fire. It, we, we call them third floors you know, of a three-story three frames. Uh, single family that was now a two, three, or four family 
because of the changing times and so forth. They're all wood frame. And I had the nozzle. Remember, you had an inch and a half hose back then. And you probably had something like an old PDQ nozzle or something like that. We didn't put emphasis on flow. You know, you didn't think about how many gallons. You just thought, you know, I'm a fireman. We pull this high as hose line. We thwart this water. And when the fire goes out. Again, this was a time when we were starting to see the changes in the materials out there. You know, the 70s. You know, more synthetics are coming about and so forth. Remember, guys back then were tough smoke eaters. And that was another thing. You were going to take that nozzle in and take it in. Don't worry about the mask, kid. Let's get that line up to the fire. Those guys could do that back then. But anyways, in this case, we had our masks on. And this this hallway, you get from the second up to the you know third floor. And it, it's a big, big place. You got an inch and a half line. And so I got the nozzle, and I'm going up there. And everything went from black to orange. So about 20 minutes later, I'm uh, laying in a gurney in Huron Hospital's emergency room. And I hear this doc walking down the hallway wanting to know where the hickory barbecue was. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wish I would have had a bigger hose line and a lot more water at that point. And like I say, those are those little things that you remember along the way in your career that, you know, when somebody's talking about, oh, we don't need that, we don't need this, you know, no, we need buku water, you know, in, in situations like that and so forth. And again, it's like the other thing too, good engine work is made better, made good by good aggressive ventilation and so forth. So, but anyway, yeah. And, and it was shortly after that, that we started seeing the inch and three quarter come on the scene also. So we got that and and you guys, Jerry, I, I'm sure Chris, you too, remember the first strain of the automatic nozzles. Remember those things? Holy cow, look at, like a boat anchor, you know, that big yellow bumper and so forth. But, uh, and then he had other manufacturers coming out with other uh, automatic nozzles and what have you and so forth. But, uh, so, yeah, so, so yeah, come on. In your experience, so kind of like you know, you you were thrown printed early on with this. You had this really bad experience. In fact, you ended up in the hospital over the thing over, basically flow rate, right? The nozzle type yeah. and what you're going for the like you were outgunned from the beginning. So that made a big impression on you. Oh my um, God, yes. What, 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 what motivated you to change, or what, what, what's your preference? Like you know, what's if your dream nozzle? What does that look like? My dream so, nozzle? Yeah, I mean, you fought a ton of fire in the city of Cleveland. What what would be the the one nozzle you would do that with? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I, I, you got to remember, I come on at a time when the fog nozzle. I'm going to preface that with this little story. You know, I came on at a time when the fog nozzle was taught strictly. Only only two and a halfs had solid bore. So you were going to take that. Uh, fog stream, open it up a little bit, and you are going to use that fog and whip it around in the fire area, and it was going to absorb all that heat from expansion of the water. You know the story. You guys all know the drill, and that's what everyone was taught. And the thing is that I remember, and I learned this years later, was that and I, I won't bring up one of your competitors' names, but they did a lot of work out in Iowa State. You know who I'm talking about. You know, about firefighting and ventilation back then. And even in uh, YouTube, there's 1951, The Nozzle Man, Part 1. And again, it shows guys no masks going in and rotating that nozzle in a circular pattern and pushing that environment ahead of you but the trucks were opening up ahead of the attack line. But once again, not much thought was given to how many gallons per minute that was being de delivered. Because, you know, I, in fact, back then, I don't even think flow meters or the idea of flow was uh, really thought of in an attack sense. And I know you had Royer and Nelson who thought about length times width times height divided by 100. And if you follow that, then we'd still be in booster lines for firefighting. Yes, uh, that didn't help you at the top of the stairs to put you in the hospital. 
<laughs> well, no, you know, <laughs> you but know, that, it, that's the it, thing. It, it's fortunately, I'm sorry, go on, Chris. It does, Jerry. It's no, interesting, sir. and I know you know you the evolution you're talking about. You know the the red line, the inch and a half, and the two and a half. I was pretty obvious which to pull at that point in time, and then right. um, inch and three quarter came. And I know you were a big part of of the two inch uh, evaluation in Cleveland oh, over the years too. Um, but you've seen, and you've not only evolved hose, but you've also evolved with nozzles. Yes. And you know, and and I know Cleveland still uses combis, but Cleveland also uses smoothbores. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's uh, probably fairly common knowledge to the American fire service, what's your preference for a smoothbore tip size on an inch and three quarter. Um, for those of you who may not be, it's somewhere in the area of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, my what? philosophy is, you know, you take as much water into battle with you as you can, because yeah. you never know <laughs> when it's going to go from black to orange. <laughs> you know, you're in the middle of it. I'm glad you said that because there's there's a lot of a lot of very vetted senior firefighters that that I, I've talked to over the years, and that is the answer to the question. You know, what do you want to take in with you? And it's the most I can absolutely hold on to and flow. Right. And you know, it 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 goes to what you were saying before. You know, the dynamics uh, of the buildings have changed. Um, heat release rates are crazy now. We all know that, but you know, you've refined it. And, and, and this is what I've enjoyed the, the times that I've been able to teach with you and, and work with you is if you, if you refine it to a target flow that's adequate for the heat release rates on today's fires, okay? You got the discipline of line size. You got a good boss calling the shots and a company working together. Um, that's a byproduct of really what you were talking about in the firehouse. It's the discipline of emptying in the trash and eating together and working together and getting all that done. Um, but the equipment thing, how, how did the job evolve with you? Were you way ahead of the job in the evolution of changing equipment or were they, were they fighting you tooth and nail? Cause you still, you see a lot of that these days. You know, no, I, I think it's, uh, actually a combination of those things. You bring up a great point for like, uh, and maybe if you talk to John, John can tell you this, you know, I started, uh, looking at our engines. And I thought, well, you know, we, we, we have a good engine f philosophy for the, for the department, but maybe we need to uh, refine it somewhat and so forth. So I, I wrote like a five-page expose, uh, expose on our engines back home. And by the way, Roger was a part of that because I consulted him on some of that stuff. And he was there when I made the presentation to the one chief. And so the thing is that uh, at that time, by the way, I got to tell you, Cleveland uh, was, uh, I'm going to throw out the, the, uh, the title Project Fires, okay? If you listen to our Senior Man Show, we've talked about that in the past. Project Fires was one of those things for modernizing a lot of things in the fire service. And I'll say it again, I've said it on that show, if anybody thinks that, the fire service is not progressive. You haven't been around long enough if you're making statements like that. If you haven't been around, you'd realize, especially back in the 70s with Project Fires, uh, right into the 80s. So it went over a long period of time. They were, they, meaning IFF, IAFC, NFPA, uh, NASA, were all involved in improving firefighter safety firefighter attack, firefighter breathing apparatus. And it was all an effort that went on over a number of years. Well, so like I said, in the 70s, we saw the inch and three quarter coming in in many departments to replace inch and a half. And it was better because we were having nozzles come out that we thought were flowing much more water. The other one, and I remember it because I remember we had a firehouse where we had two engines and a truck running out of and very busy, very busy, uh, that they had two inch line. And it was a test back then too, two inch line. Two inch line, Jerry, Chris, maybe you remember the old European couplings that was on a two inch line? Yep. That was an idea that was being field tested in many fire departments. By the way, this field testing took place in many fire departments, especially your large metropolitan departments across the country. 
to see about this modernization, better better fatigues for guys or workstation wear, turnout gear, breathing apparatus and attack capabilities, all that stuff. And by the way, in the late 70s is when the uh, firefighter journeyman training was coming out also. And that was uh, uh, the IFF, the IAFC and the US Department of Labor had joined together to standardize training for fire departments. So it was kind of like a precursor to NFPA 1001-1002, you know, where we were trying to raise a standard or raise the bar for firefighter basic training, and just like we were talking about earlier. So anyways, two-inch line uh, was on a, a few engines, and it was like, oh, okay, yeah, this is two-inch line and so forth. Different materials, rubber line, rubber-covered hose, all that stuff was out there too. And I'm looking at where it went. So like in the early 80s, you know, we were getting all this new hose and so forth. We had inch and three quarter, two inch, a little bit of two and a half and so forth. And then the nozzles. And they see that's where I feel that we kind of got on the wrong track with the nozzles. Simply because we had the automatic nozzles, the manufacturers were pushing those that, oh, this nozzle here, it can regulate its own pressure. Just put a little bit more pressure into it and you can throw more water, throw more water from a smaller hose. Well, again, physics and so forth took over. And you hear guys talking today about back pressure and stuff like that, you know, and when they were saying that uh, in some cases, inch and three quarter was believed to have been able to throw as much as a two and a half inch hose. And I was thinking, well, let's do the numbers here. What would the friction loss be to push 265 gallons a minute through inch and three quarter hose at 100 PSI nozzle pressure? You know, it was crazy. And I told you guys, you're going to need everybody on this uh, company and the next company down to lay on this hose line to hold it down if it doesn't burst. You know, because back then, I think hose had an annual test pressure of like 250 pounds anyhow. So you see how we were stepping over, stepping into an area that, you know, like we needed a lot more work. Okay, so let's fast forward. So I was, uh, like I say, in, in the 2000s, I was at FDIC one year talking with some hose manufacturers at their uh, kiosks. And I was asking them about formulas for hose and things like that. And the guys, everyone I talked to said the same thing about friction loss formulas, forget them. And it was because the different materials that hoses are made out of now, they're all made to the NFPA standards, but you got different liner materials, you got different outer jacket materials, the nozzles, the nozzle technology now is to me far, far away. So much better than it was back in the seventies. I have to tell you, you know, from what I was working with, like we mentioned earlier, the PDQ nozzles or the other ones, that, uh, whatever. And, you know, like John, you know, can tell you, when I was on a job and we'd turn a corner and we'd see the fire down there waiting for us, you know, I would, I would start saying, or somebody would say, say, you know, we're going solid bore. And I think that was a great thing to manufacture a nozzle that has both fog tip and solid bore capabilities and at the same pressure yeah that game changer um and it's you know i i we've we've had this conversation and john and i have too you know there's uh it, the right nozzle is is the one in front of the fire but it has to have the right flow um you know the, the break apart uh, it does become a, a game changer because it gives you choice at the point of attack with no change at the rig right there's not a hydraulic complication uh, complication in making the switch um you, you mentioned something that uh, and i know you i'll set you up for this because i know you're an advocate of it um and and you and i have have gone deep over the years on intermediate hose size uh yep. with being an alternative and that's one of the things anybody that's taken uh, a course from you or strategic uh fire training uh, gets great, they get exposure to the breadth of the American Fire Service. You know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, over one majority of your experience was in a very disciplined urban career fire department, um, you're also a realist. And the realist, you know, I think back to when we were down in, in, the, in the Carolinas and, and down south. And, 
you know, you've got an entire shift to 12 or 15 people, um, you know, with, with a vertical exposure. We've got standpipes and, and maneuverability on the line becomes an issue. Um, it, it seems the way I, I've always appreciated the way you've narrowed things down to re really three tip sizes. And, and, and it's the it's the 15, 16, inch and 1 16th, an inch and an eighth. Um, and I doubt there's anybody on here that doesn't know what they flow, but you know, it's 185, 240, and, and 265. Um, the, I, the, I think that approach simplifies things because you have flow windows based on firewood, and, and one doesn't replace the other, one's an intermediate step to get to the big line, and uh, you know, which I think you refer to as the king of hose lines, the two and a yeah. half, yeah. But, you know, that, that mentality, I think, has value. And the way you teach it is, is, is significant, too. Um, was, it, what, it, was it just a success at fires that drove you to those flow windows, those tip sizes? Uh, first of all, let, let, let me work my way into that. Uh, firefighting is circumstantial. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and that's why... You stick with the principles. You stick with the basics that get you there. You know, this isn't something that I come up with. The basics were there when I come in a job, and they, those same basics were there for the people before me. So, again, you pass this on to your people. Don't confuse me with all these different pressures and all these different flows. And you're right on, Jerry, about those three basic tip sizes at 50 PSI. If you want to run a promotional exam and say, hey, if we pump through this size orifice at this, then I'll throw a, a formula at you that you can study and then maybe take the, and get the uh, test, uh, you know, or whatever, you know, get the test question answered that way. But keep it simple. One of the things we do when we go out, we always have two inch hose with us. We have it shipped there if they don't already have it. And of course, you guys supply us with the nozzles and our, all our hardware. And it works so great. Boy, do the jaws hit the hit the pavement when they see what a three-person engine is able to do with two-inch hose. Okay, now let's go back to the 70s again. And we look at what the hoses were made from. Remember, I mentioned just a minute ago, different liner materials, different outer jacket materials, and things like that. All those things together and more along with the nozzle technology, the way the nozzles are machined and so forth, allow us to have greater flows with manageability more so than we would ever, ever would have thought of in the past. I was uh, charged with putting all the engine companies in Cleveland through a back-to-basics engine class back in 2007. So we had, like I said before, we had engine three-quarter, two-inch, two-and-a-half. And as I compared the two-inch hose to the inch and three quarter hose, our officers, you know, the higher up said, when we get this two inch hose, we're gonna put automatic nozzles on it. And when we get the inch and three quarter hose, it will have a 60 to 200 gallon minute range automatic nozzle on it. Guess which one was flowing more water per our uh, designated pump pressures? The inch and three quarter hose. So what happened here? Well, again, as I said, this hose was all older hose. And when you looked at it, how it was put together and so forth, it was like, how, oh, my God, you know, and I thought, get rid of the two inch hose because, you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> not doing anywhere near what we thought it would flow. In fact, it's flowing less than inch and three quarter. Okay, right. so here we are in the 2000s and the different material materials and that one and one sixteenth inch tip jar. Remember, we showed that we saw that. And that's when you first uh, brought it out down yep. there in Carolinas. And we look at the fifty psi nozzle pressure once again, and then the friction loss in that newer uh, manufacturer of two inch hose. Oh my God, it's a winner. Yep. So we like to present it as an intermediate size hose line where a uh, three member engine, they've got a hose line. There's 68 pounds of water weight in a 50 foot length of two inch hose. You got at least 240, and we have done as high as 270 gallons a minute off, off of a two inch hose because it will vary per the style or the uh, type of hose. So we go, we tell people between 240 and 260 gallons a minute. 
and it's still very manual. Look, I'm going to be 68 years old in two weeks here. I can handle it very easily. So that's the thing about knowing techniques and knowing how to hold things. Nozzle mechanics, proper pump pressure at the nozzle, 50 PSI. Keep it simple. So um, that, that, that one tip we basically has been dubbed the shoop tip. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, just based on your experience alone, you know, um, sometimes like when we went to the West Coast and you bring two inch attack hose, guys have never heard of it, but right. you, you've been dealing with it for literally decades. So um, you talk about experience matters. That's a big deal. And, and you having dealt with those automatic nozzles to get to this, this oh. niche, this niche tip, we like to say, I mean, if you want more info, Jeff has done a, a two or three episodes on brass tacks, hard facts.com on two inch with one and one sixteenth. So this is why he's so passionate. He's been doing this for a long time with this hose and this tip. It's simple stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's simple. You know, you have this size hose, then you have this size hose, then you have this size hose. And that was something that was given to me by a young fireman years ago. The question was, why do we have different size hose lines? Well, because we want to flow and we need to flow different volumes of water. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, you know, he gave me the answer. So how do we flow it? You can't flow it if you can't control it. Right. So there's your 50 PSI. It's what, uh, it's what uh, uh, they did in Lawrence, Massachusetts back in 1888, Freeman. And, uh, you know, it worked then. <laughs> so. Jeff, let me... Yeah. Let me I'm ask you a couple of questions for a couple of different vintages. Um, you're widely recognized and respected as, as uh, a senior man uh, on the job and, and, and still active in instruction to this day. What do you, what do you say to the five year, the zero five year firefighter now about mental attitude and, and, and how to approach the job? Oh, wow. Well, a, a couple good nuggets. <laughs> kind of remember, uh, yeah, not kind of, not kind of. Uh, remember who you are and where you are in your career. Because if you stay with this job, someday you will be a senior man. What kind of senior man do you want to be? And that's the thing. Yeah, you got a lot of guys who are coming into the job now, young people, and they want to go out there and they want to teach and so forth. And they want to stand in front of the crowd and whatever. Learn a job first, okay? It's okay to go out, and if you want to help some uh, people when the class is going on, but this is a job that's time-honored. And we learn it over time. And, we, and the, with the changes and so forth, you need the older senior members to carry on the principles to pass on to the younger people. So when they get up there and they're standing in front of that crowd and they're or the senior man out on the fire ground, that's when it counts. All right, that's that's awesome. What what do you now? What do you say? What do you say to the fifteen year guy? that's just surviving now that's that's a hard thing there because you know as as people get on in their years how do you change them and some guys are going to fight you no matter what you know they're not going to pay attention to it yes yeah, so. what, what outlying companies are for right that's what what outlying companies are for. <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> And you know what? There's guys with five years of the job are ready for those too. <laughs> well, you know, and, and it's why I'm asking the question that way. And what and, and let me, let's let's hit the top end of this. What do you say to maintain the passion to the senior man that's still in the firehouse today, um, despite the challenges it can have? Uh, what's your nuggets there? Oh my God. That that's that's an interesting and, and it's also a hard one because you're asking me to define somebody and we're all different. We're all cut from a different mold and you know, we're, we're, we're not equal. You know, despite what someone might say out there in the political world, we're not equal, okay? 
We all come from different backgrounds. We're all born and raised in different environments and so forth. That's the interesting thing about the fire service. We have these people from the different uh, cultures, different backgrounds and things like that. And we look and say, I want to be a fireman. So they come to the fire service. And that's the hardest thing about taking people and making them a team. And that's why we need to have uh, things like procedures, seniority, experience to bring these people in and not have any interference. That's another thing that fire services run into recently. Uh, it's not even recently, it's been out there for a number of years coming on. Too much influence from the outside. People, you know, there's been all kinds of studies. And I remember reading, you guys remember old Fire Command magazine? Yep. It was published by the NFPA back in the 70s. Oh my God. And they had some interesting articles back then. I remember a couple of those that were like psychology and the this and that and whatever. It's like, holy cow. But that's the thing. You know, that's a hard thing about uh, if you're going to have personnel issues. How do you address them? Like I said, you got an outside interference. You got people who are putting, let's, let's just say, for example, you got a troublemaker in a firehouse. You know, I, I heard this one. This is, this is good. Guy, guy had no in, interest in being there, but he's getting a paycheck and whatever, doing the, doing the least amount possible. Okay. And then of course, when you say, come on, let's do some training, let's do this. Or how about doing some housework, you know? And it's like, uh, if it makes its way downtown, it's interesting. People in human resources ask, well, what did you do to help this person? Are you fucking kidding me? This guy went to the academy and was passed through. And everyone's got the chance to be a good firefighter in this job. That's my point. Everyone's got the chance. And that's the whole thing about, you know, trying to build a team and solidify it. And then, of course, from there, you hope it grows and gets bigger throughout the department and so forth. Hard thing to do, especially in today's environment. So, I would agree. We got a question. I'll take it back uh, on, on a fire uh, development over your your career. James uh, Johnson, who uh, um, we were just we were, uh, texting earlier, he's, he's uh, going back to an engine. So, uh, good question. Um, I'll read the whole thing to you because you won't be able to see it all on the screen. So, it's uh, uh, shoot. Were you guys aware at the time that there were more synthetic materials coming in and noticing a distinct change in fire behavior, or was it more of a gradual change? Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> I, you know, <laughs> you're asking me to remember back to the 70s, you know, and <laughs> I'll try my best. And I remember hearing guys talk about it. You know, my, my God, that was a smoky fire. Oh, man, that smoke was really different. You know, you heard guys saying things like that. You know, you see the color of that smoke? So there were changes coming. It wasn't a regular mattress fire or kitchen or kitchen dinette set or anything like that. It wasn't, wasn't stuff like that. We're talking about the materials, you know, that were used that were, you know, creating different uh smoke conditions and, and and so forth and uh then we finally got smart about it we finally got smart about the job we had some bosses who said you know what we got to get these guys in masks all the time you gotta remember the other thing too i remember this is funny once again you try to remember back and i sometimes jog my memory that you didn't want to use those masks because after all we got to get them refilled and that that takes air, and that means the bottles will have to go somewhere. Like, oh my God! It's like, oh okay. <laughs> it's just like don't use water, or use as little water as possible to put the fire out. We don't want to cause water damage. At at a time was said when we were seeing this change to hotter, more intense fires. So you know, and again, project fires was also taking place back then too. So you had all this information, all these ideas coming together. It was like, holy cow. So I hope I answered that, uh, you know, question for the guy. Yes, James. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting evolution. Um, you know, and the I guess the answer to the question hasn't really changed. Uh, it's just, um, it's a flow rate. 
Um, you need you need to overcome the heat release rate, and and water yeah. water is going to win when you're face to face with that. Yeah, um, I tell you what, I, I was I was uh, oh god, this is going back. I'd come home from uh, South Carolina, so I was asked to take a handoff class for strategy and tactics, some outreach handoff course from our state fire academy. And this is 2014, so. I'm down in this class. There's about 25 guys in there, you know, and all these guys. I really didn't know anybody in there from other other. They were instructors from other parts of the state, except one other guy. And so they're talking about all this stuff about heat release rate and things like that, and smoke and so forth. And it, I realized I was with a different crowd of instructors. They weren't from my time or my era. 2014. And that's why I said you asked me about the five year the five year uh, you know person okay yep so I was we were talking about you know uh, heat buildup and ventilation and what about this construction oh man I was just really involved in this class and I says has anybody here teach their people still if you got a situation where you're down low you can't move it's hot you hear it crackling you don't see anything you got your laps down and so forth your hood up you take your gloves off and stick it above your head just to get an idea of the heat that you're in and there's one guy oh are you kidding me oh he just exploded oh my god he's don't you ever dispense and don't you ever talk about dispensing with any part of your protective gear and i'm thinking you have no clue about what you're talking about you want to turtle up, put yourself in an environment. Maybe we're talking about a different fire situation. Maybe he wouldn't even be in there. I don't know. But getting a sense of that, okay? Oh, it was just so terrible. I used to teach that at our academy. <laughs> you get a feel for it, man. You hear it popping around you. You don't see anything. Also, start flowing water. Yeah. 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 You know, one, one thing I, uh, I want I want to tell I want you to tell one more story before before we finish up. But um, you know the the approach to to your instruction that uh, that I admire and any and anyone I think that ever has been involved with it is is the simplicity of it um, because it does go back to the fundamentals, the basic. It's just like what we titled tonight as engine company fundamentals. Um, if you don't have a foundation, uh, you're you're not going to stand up to the storm. It's, it's about roots. It's not about branches. Uh, there's a lot of people that are out just looking for blossoms and taking low-hanging fruit. The discipline comes within, uh, and if you don't catch that culture early on, some people survive. Some people don't make it, right? No. Um, but there's no doubt you, it's your personal journey into understanding fire dynamics and, and, and water and, and how it's a game changer. Uh, you helped your job do it. You continue to help the American Fire Service and, and the fire service worldwide do it. Um, you know, uh, high volume, low pressure works because you can flow a decent amount of water and it's manageable by your firefighters. Not everybody's six foot four and 275 pounds. So that's a reality. Um, you tell one story and it was at a training fire. It was years ago. Uh, it was two and a half story frame. And you were outside running the drill. And uh, and stuff was going south inside. Uh, you know the one I'm talking about, <laughs> where where the you know the engine wasn't a, a, a major factor in the delivery of the water. <laughs> it was just a valve. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want, I'd love you to tell that story because I I I I'll be honest with you. I steal the concept as a benefit of of a low pressure high volume nozzle in a mechanical breakdown or a situation like that so if you would just share that oh yeah and this goes right back to being a young kid that story about you know ending up in the gurney right okay so we were doing a live burn and these two fire departments and both good fire departments you know both good guys i had a lot of these guys when they were younger cadets in fire school well we've got this uh, two and a half story frame, it's probably 25 by 40, two stories, and it's got a big bump out on the attic. And we had three, three what you would consider good fires in the morning, 
We shut everything down, broke it down for lunch. Everybody got lunch. We came back. And that was our goal was to have three more fires in the afternoon, just like we had in the morning. So uh, we had this fire. And I, you're right, Jerry. I, that one was a real wake-up call for me. I have since I got the video of it. Thank God somebody was videoing that. And they got the sound, too. And also I drew up uh, an overhead for the floor, lay floor layout the floor plan of the place. So we started the fire, first fire after lunch, in the back of the structure. Here's our goals. Locate the fire, confine it, extinguishment. Go in through the front door and go down, get the get the uh, nozzle in place and kill the fire. Just that simple, okay? The hose lines we use were inch and three quarter, okay? So, uh, we start the fire, we've got skids in this back room and skids are going pretty good. Next thing you know, it's rolling around, rolling around, it's going out that way, it's going out that way. And I says, okay, let's get everybody out and let's get the attack started. So you can hear the radio traffic. That's why I say, well, I was so fortunate to have somebody doing all that work, uh, recording that. And I even say on the, uh, the radio, you have to move quickly. I could read this fire. It was coming fast. Yep. So. And that, and that was that was the lesson, right? <laughs> oh, my God, was it. The line goes in, and I'm watching this fire. I'm going around. And, again, this is a thing for fire departments that think your incident commander can be half a block away and know what's going on. Absolutely not. Okay. This fire is belching out the rear, the side, and the other side of the rear of the house, okay? We had one, two, three rooms completely involved in fire. I thought I had an inch and three-quarter line in there, and in the meantime, another line had gotten deployed. And I'm reading this fire, I'm thinking, oh, my God. See, that's the thing about, you know, uh, incident commanders, chief officers, whatever their title is. You need to be right at that fire so you can see what's happening. I looked at the hose lines with fire coming out of three sides of the rear of the structure. I mean, roaring good. And the hose lines are both still, standing still. There's no steam, no gray coming out from the flames. The flames aren't darkening down. The smoke is really getting more intense and belching out even more. And I, okay, I got to go find what the hell's going on here. And I crawl in, and like I said, I did not know somebody had deployed a second line. I crawl in, I'm screaming through the blackness, you know, where's the attack line? Where's the attack line? And they said, they're there ahead of us, because I thought these guys were the attack crew, and they weren't. So I got guys in there deeper in this joint, and I'm just thinking, oh, this thing's going to go bang, and I'm going to end up with half a dozen guys in the burn unit tonight. Is it going to look good for my resume? I got a little bit further forward and found the guy with the nozzle, and I ripped it out of his hands. Like I said, we couldn't see each other. The heat is right down to the floor, and it's miserable, and I just start opening up the nozzle, okay? So it's a 15 16th solid bore. So we can knock it down, we knock it down, we knock it down, and when I felt we had this thing back under control, I gave the nozzle to the nozzle man. I said, come on, I think it's over here, and there was the hallway back to where the fire really came from. Afterwards, I got everybody together. And my, my buddy who I was doing the training work with, he said afterwards, he says, man, he said, I, I've never seen you get like that. You look like a cobra. I was like, I want to know what in the hell went wrong from the morning fires. And so uh, I went to the nozzle man and I says, how come when things had, were so bad in there, things were turning to shit, why didn't you open up that nozzle in that environment? Everybody's got the answer. I didn't see any flames. We were taught in school never to throw water into smoke. Your training failed you at that point. And that's something an instructor doesn't know when he's putting on a fire like that. Are these people going to make the right decision in that in that case? Okay. 
And I went through a couple of other things and so forth. I says, look, you're into the commander. He needs to be up here. Did you not see that both hose lines were stagnant, dormant, not moving? The changing, there was no change in the fire, no steam, no nothing coming out because no water was uh, being put on the fire. If you got two lines laying in the doorway in the smoke and the flames are still belching out, you got a real problem. Well, the best part was the pump operator who comes up to me afterwards. He says, Jeff, I don't know if I should tell you this, but uh, uh, the engine wasn't in gear. We were operating off a of hydrant pressure. That's testimony to the 15th, 16th, and always had that mentality. You take as much water in the battle with you as you can just for those mistakes. Just for something like that. Remember, that was the first fire after launch. We had shut down, and that was one of the steps that was missed by the pump operator. How critical that is. So fortunately, we had a good supply from the Hydra. But that was, a, like I said, the, the engine was nothing more than a gate valve at that point. Right. So, and it saved us because we had over three rooms roaring in, inside that joint. I got the video. You, you guys have seen it, I know, uh, many times. Yeah, so, hundred percent. CSI automatic. We're gonna give you the flow you needed. Yep. Hey Jeff, um, I'm gonna throw this question up from Kevin, and it might cut off, so I'll read it out loud for everybody. Um, what's your stance on flowing while to try trying to go up the staircase to second or third floor fire? I think this is a valuable skill to practice. I know you teach us a lot in your classes. Uh, if a guy's been through Ronaldo Ford. There's a lot of guys out here teaching. You see videos all the time of guys pushing staircases. So what's your thoughts on flowing up upstairs? Uh, I've, I've got uh, I got a couple of questions about doing it. I like to have my feet stable and in a stance, flowing water, knocking the fire down ahead of me, then moving up. And that's one of the things that we do with strategic fire. When we go out there, you know, whether it's inch and three quarter or if it's two and a half, because we teach two and a half movement also. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things you can do when you have guys, the right manpower and the right training. But yeah, we uh, like to hit it hard from that one position first and then move up that way rather than have somebody have a misstep and maybe tumble backward on the steps, lose control of the nozzle or whatever. Hit it hard from this location, give it a good dash, you know, for you know, whatever, nail it down a little bit, and then make your move up the stairs. Yeah. Hey, Chris, there's another one I want you to throw up there real quick is uh, from John. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I'll pronounce this right. Jorger, J-O-E-R-G-E-R. I'm -E -E mm, looking for it, Jerry. 2116. Uh, while you're trying to find it, I'll, I'll read it. Um, it's uh, Jeff, and this is one. This is this is this is a, a hotly contested uh, actually. What's your preference? <laughs> Good for question. Yeah. Good question. All right, so you, you can know? see what's your preference for the probe on the hose line for their first structure fire. <laughs> You see, it goes back to that thing about uh, the person coming out of the school and you're putting that nozzle in their hands. And if you get that very critical fire situation, how do you know what they're going to do? When they've been dealing with uh, the steel burn building or the concrete burn building for the last 12 weeks, and now here comes the real stuff. And that's a, that's a call for that officer to make. And I have no problem with the officer saying, no, John's going to be the nozzle man. Okay. You watch him. If John moves, you move. You stick with him like flies on shit, you know, or something like that. And that's what needs to happen. You know, again, bring the probie in, uh, you know, bring in, bring him into the system. And so, now, here's the other thing. Here, here's the problem. What if you have three people on an engine and the guy in the back step is the probie? You've got no choice, officer. So you better have this guy out there uh, in the parking lot going over nozzle mechanics, going over hose line management and things like that. And then in a fire, once again, this other thing about the uh, company officer is supposed to be right there with the nozzle man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, ideally, ideally that boss should be between one and two spot. But um, 
and it, 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 it unfortunately doesn't happen that way. Oh. It, it, I, I, I'm glad that question came up. It's it's one that uh, there's a lot of discussion about. Seems like there's a, a propensity to have the new guy on the knob all the time, which uh, at certain fires, I, I agree with you, it's not necessarily the best idea, uh, yeah. especially with marginal. Um, you know, I'm sorry. When we go out, you know, uh, us guys, when we go out with our strategic fire training, we always try to keep it relevant. And we tell everybody when we walk into a place that we're gonna keep it to three people on an engine because that's what we're seeing in much of the fire service. If you got four or five or six guys on an engine, God bless you, okay? But for most of the fire departments out there, it's three people and in some cases less. Yep. So what do you do? You know, and it's a sad thing. Uh, hose line, you know, we, we talk about keeping your hose load simple. Don't make them complex. Don't make a hose load in your engine that requires four guys to pull it when you only got two or three guys available. It doesn't make sense. And again, this is where, like I say, the nozzle technology, you know, your, your nozzle products and so forth are fantastic, you know. But how do you give that three-member engine uh, the biggest bang for the buck? Again, training and the right equipment and take as much water in with you as you can, because you might not have help on that hose line. It's all you got at that point. Got a, got, a, got a little story. It goes back to my article in Fire Engineering Magazine back in 2013, the last one I ever wrote for them. And I was talking about a fire uh, in a carpet store. And Diane, if you know Diane from Fire Engineering, you know, when I, when I wrote it, I used to do so many articles for fire engineering in the past and, and so forth. And she says, is this you? <laughs> I says, yeah, I jazzed it up, you know, because it was 2013. But it was when I was a young fireman. And, uh, you know, it was a, a, a carpet store, you know, just a typical taxpayer. You know, I forget what the dimensions were that I put on there, maybe 50 or 75 by 120 deep with a uh, zero visibility condition. But you got the other engine coming in and you got another engine coming in. You got a truck and all this other stuff. I explained the whole fire and it was entitled something like gallons per minute puts the fire out. And like I said, it happened a long, long time ago. And again, the uh, the uh, attack, it was really inch and a half hose. Taking it into a store like that, zero visibility, and the heat is starting to come down. And you can hear, you know, you, you ever hear hot metal starting to stretch a little, you know, stretch? You know, you hear that singing out, you know, and it's like you can't throw enough water out of that hose line. Even inch and three quarter in a fire like that, no. And of course, at that point, when you realize that your hose line is not able to put that fire out or protect that environment around you immediately, you are relying on your turnout gear to save your life in that environment. This is how important this stuff is to understand. And like I said, that was, a, look it up, that was gallons per minute. Two inch at the minimum. And again, look at the newer hose and what the flow rates are and what the nozzles are capable of doing and so forth. Remember, I, I, and I can't say it enough, 50 PSI. Don't over pump it. Don't make it something that this guy can't hold, especially in a situation like that. So, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, what, it's what the job is. <laughs> so. Well, I appreciate you. Um, as we're winding down here, um, I think, you know, the value of, of uh, uh, this type of discussion with a senior man, especially so disciplined in an engine, is, is tremendous. Um, for those that have the, uh, the Brass Tax Hard Facts segments that Jeff has done um, go very much into the disciplines of line position, nozzle, backup door, um, extensions, it, it, just about anything um, you would like them to. But they're very, they're very um, basic driven, and that again, I, I think we can all agree that's where things break. It doesn't happen at the complexity, the complex decision. It happens where a firefighter fails because of a lack of knowledge or comfort with the with the job uh, that that he holds within the team. 
Um, look, uh, please search out Jeff and, and the group at Strategic Fire Training. Um, they're uh, they're very active throughout the country in instruction, and and I can personally attest. Uh, you know, once once you're friends with any of those guys, the dialogue is always there. If you want to pick up the phone and chat, Jeff is that type of guy. Um, you know, there was a comment early on in the feed about the kitchen table and the value of that. The value of that type of conversation is uh, uh, not as paramount in the fire service now as I think it as it was when I got in, and that, and I missed that. Um, there's there's a lot of, a lot of problems are solved before they surface if you're having those types of conversations and having those kitchen table talks after a job where something goes sideways. So uh, from me to you, Jeff, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I, we could go for hours. Uh, I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I, I didn't even break out the other stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, you know, open up here and keep on going. But uh, for me to you, thanks. And thanks for sharing that knowledge and continue to be active in instruction to this day. And John, and John yeah, there you go. So un unfortunately, with FDIC uh, being canceled, postponed, I guess we're waiting to hear. But uh, Jeff, uh, and John and his crew from strategic fire training. We're doing the engine essentials this year. So uh, we'll stay tuned there again. You can find these guys at strategic fire training uh, on Facebook. Um, the other great resource that is out there that um, Aaron Fields and his crew from nozzle Ford put together, which is on uh, nozzle Ford.com. Uh, I believe the tabs resources or downloads. Um, it's that's the book of shoop. So basically, um, they did a very nice thing and an awesome oh report where they basically took everything that Jeff um, has written from FDIC articles, or sorry, fire engineering articles to uh, department memos, you know, instituting change. You know, there was one of the questions that we had earlier about instituting change, um, you know, keep driving. And then Jeff, uh, you can get a pulse, not knowing Jeff. You can read this and get a pulse and a feel for who he is and who he who he was as a firefighter for the city of Cleveland. Um, and it's a it's a great resource. You can download it. There are great articles. I know we're finding new ways to train for your uh, your you know, monthly training packets to pop them out to your firefighters or whatever. Um, there's really good resource there at nozzle4.com. So we encourage you to check that out. Um, and again, strategic fire training. Jeff, anything else you want to add there? Where else we can find you? Yeah. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to you know recognize the guys who make up strategic fire training. Look, you and Jerry, both you guys, we did a lot of work in the past, and it was always a great time and uh, a lot of fun out there. And uh, you know, the guys who are make up fire, uh, strategic fire, I want to give them a pat on the back also for, you know, you got Chad, you got Micah, Diedrich, and uh, Jerry Knapp, the whole time where he's with us now, you had him on two weeks ago, yeah. and so yeah. forth. And we just continue it on, you know. Uh, we just all, like, like I said, everybody is together in tune and what have you. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to doing more with fire departments out there. Aaron Fields, I, if you come across the story of Aaron, uh, oh my God, this is back about 2002 and we were out in California and for some reason, you know, Aaron was in class and he'll tell, I think he'll tell the same story when he, when he's asked to, you know, he was having some trouble with the hose line. So I took myself out of the, the group and the other instructors stayed with the other students and I worked with Aaron for about 20, 25 minutes, I would say. And that was it. You know, he went back into the class with, uh, or went back into the hands-on stuff and so forth. About eight years later, I get a call from Ted Corporandi. Hey, Jeff, uh, how you doing? You know, this guy, Aaron Fields. I says, no, he's just from Seattle. And he says he had you as an instructor and so forth. And uh, I said, oh, really? uh where was this or when was this and he said oh back then i said oh my god it's either i think it was uh when we went out to sacramento fdic west out there so about 2000 uh one or two so as time goes on from that 2010 
couple of guys would take his class and he always mentioned Jeff Shoup. Jeff Shoup was one of my instructors. Jeff Shoup has been a mentor to me and so forth. And uh, I would get texts or emails or something like that. And Jeff Diedrich has taken or had taken Aaron's classes a couple of times over in Pennsylvania, I think it is, or was. And he says, Jeff Shoup was my instructor in the fire academy back in 94, back home. And he's, oh, really? So time goes on, Aaron and I reconnect. And at the one year, we were both at the old uh, Andy Fredericks training days, you know. They asked me to come in and do a class, and Aaron's been there a couple of times and so forth. And so we were kind of reconnected that way. So I did not know, but Aaron had talked to his guys, talked to John, right there, Diedrich, and uh, they were working with my wife here at home and going through boxes and boxes of stuff and papers and all this stuff and a lot of stuff that I'd worked on behind my back. Two years after that, I get a call from Aaron. He says, hey, listen, uh, you know, you're, you're going to find out soon, but I figured I'd call you right now. He says, uh, we've got the book of uh, Shoop coming out. It's the book of what? <laughs> you know, the book of who? And it was really something I could never, ever thank him enough or the guys who helped uh, put it together. Uh, that's one of those things. And so I just always have to acknowledge that. Because you know what I've told so many people at classes? There's a certain amount of respect. You can be the senior man, and you got a couple kinds of senior man you can be. The kind of guy who's just there in seniority or the kind of guy who's got respect for his firefighters underneath him as a senior man and that you're going to help those guys. And it's a two-way street, okay? Because I tell people also, you never know – who in front of you is going to be the next Aaron Fields. And that's why you should treat people with respect and have a good time and that way when you're out training. So, yeah. Hey, we do have a class come out. Can I say anything about that? 100%. Let us know where to find you, where we can track you down, where we can take your class, any of that good stuff. Let us know. Okay, I think we got uh, a Zoom class for Sons of the Flag. That's that organization that takes care of uh, wounded military and firefighter personnel. Yep. Uh, you guys are very well, you know, versed on, you know, Sons of the Flag because we all go together out there to uh, Oregon. That's one of the many places. So Chad Gruber, he's one of our team members for strategic uh, fire training, and he's got something coming up. I think it's the 28th of May that him and I are going to do something online. I'm going to do 25 tips for the aggressive engine company. Okay. So, so they get that on your Facebook page, Jeff? What's that? And they get that on the strategic fire training uh, 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 Facebook page? Should be there. They, yeah. They can definitely get it on the SFT website. Um, it's $10. It's a $10 donation to help um, the fundraiser for the uh, Sons of the Flag as well, guys. So. Let's keep that okay. Just we also have it. Yeah, we've got a couple more dates coming up, and hopefully this uh, this thing we can get back to some sense of normalcy and get out there and do a lot of uh, good work with fire departments across the country. So, yeah. So awesome. Well, um, as as we say. Um, you can you can go view the series at brasshacksartfacts.com. Uh, you can see all of Jeff's videos. He's got some really great stuff on nozzle team positions to how we have to treat this as a system. You know, this isn't just a component thing. We have to view this as a whole thing, um, down to two inch lines versus two and a half, and the one and one sixteenth. If you like some more information on that, um, so those are all there. Any sort of technical information. Um, Give us you a call. Yep. Get, give us a call. You can go to elkartbrass.com. There's a lot of stuff there. And then to remind everybody before we sign off here, you know, at Elkhart Brass, we're part of Safe Fleet. So we're in the Fire EMS and Industrial Group. That's um, FRC, Foam Pro, us, and ROM. So if you're specking out a rig, you're looking for some new equipment, our latest and greatest stuff, 
can be found at safely.net slash FEI. Um, and that'll give you the landing page to get where you have to go or put you in touch with somebody to help you out. So um, big thanks to Jerry and Jeff for tuning in tonight. Um, John. And John. <laughs> you know, right. actually, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for John. So all That's of you true. in the Wide Wide, really, we really need to thank John. And, and maybe John's wife, because I think this is her computer. But, yeah. um, it, it, hey, uh, we're going to have Elkhart equipment up in uh, Wisconsin first weekend in uh, June. Okay. We'll make sure yep. it's there. Go flow on it. Learn from the, learn from the man himself. Yeah. Well, thank you. Very complimentary. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. H hang in there. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And um, we will be back here next Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. And this will be on YouTube in about 24 hours. So thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Thanks.